go ahead with tonight's presentation. So welcome everyone and uh, thank you for taking time this evening to join us for our presentation um, with our two wonderful presenters, Jane Cooper and Dr. Michael O'Hagan. Um, so tonight, uh, the Osgood Township Museum will be speaking about German prisoner uh, of war in World War II Canada and Metcalf Project. Before we get started with our presentation, we would like to acknowledge that we would like to acknowledge that the museum located in Vernon, Ontario, just uh, in Ottawa, uh, is on the traditional and ceded ancestral land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. The Algonquin Anishinaabe are the original inhabitants of this territory along the Ottawa, Rideau, and Castor Rivers, and have lived on this land since time immemorial. We are grateful to have the opportunity to be present on this land. For those who aren't uh, familiar with the Osgoode Township Museum, we are located in Vernon, Ontario, which is about 45 minutes uh, south on Bank Street in the very uh, southernmost part of Ottawa. Uh, we have a three acre site. Um, on that site, we have our main museum building, which is a 1960s schoolhouse. We have an agricultural barn and uh, a wonderful grounds of heritage school garden and a sensory garden that we're currently working on. We uh, have a new, uh, brand new permanent exhibit space. If you haven't been out to visit the museum, have the opportunity to do so. We are open um, five days a week um, and four days a week during the winter hours. Um, so please come out and uh, take a look at some of the local history you have, you have here. We also have our agricultural barn um, that uh, is open during the spring, summer, and fall. It features a lot of our agricultural and rural uh, industrial equipment. And just a reminder for those, um, if you uh, aren't muted, please do so instead of the respect of the presenters for tonight. And speaking about presenters, our two presenters this evening, thank you to Jane and Michael for joining us. Um, so Michael, originally from rural Manitoba, is a historian with a PhD in history from Western University with a speciali specialization in German prisoners of war in Canada during the Second World War. Michael's PhD dissertation, Beyond the Barbed Wire, POW Labor Projects in Canada during the Second World War, examined German prisoner of wars and labor projects in Canada, primarily in Northwestern Ontario, Alberta, and Manitoba. Jane Cooper is a historian, researcher, and writer. Undertaking government policy research by day, by night she escapes into the history of the early 20th century. Jane has worked on several well-known local history projects, including some in partnership with the Osgood Museum, Private Sully Goes to War, um, the Osgood uh, Historical Tour of 1900 Metcalf, just to name a few. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna add everyone else who's in the waiting room to our meeting. Uh, presentation and I'm going to pass it over to Michael to start. So I'm going to stop my screen share and we'll get Michael joining in. Perfect. Let's see if I can get this to work. And if at any point um, anyone has any questions or any comments, please feel free, free to throw them into our chat function at the bottom of the screen and uh, we can answer those at the end of the presentation. Perfect. Is that screen working? Hopefully. All right. Uh, thank you, Jillian, um, for having me. And thank you to uh, Jane for kind of roping me into this uh, subject a little bit more than what I was able to cover in my dissertation. Um, so as Jillian mentioned, I'm a historian who specializes in POWs in Canada during the Second World War. And today I'll be talking uh, to you kind of just a brief introduction about internment in Canada uh, during this period before jumping in to discuss the Metcalf project as a whole. Um, so when we think of, or when most people think of prisoners of war in the Second World War, uh, we often think of allied prisoners in Germany and the often poor treatment of prisoners there. We might, you know, jump to the classic series Hogan's Heroes or the classic film The Great Escape. But in the Canadian context, uh, it's often thought of as the, in the forced relocation and incarceration of Japanese Canadians. Um, but what many re Canadians don't remember is that the war, prisoners of war, were actually much closer to home. So with a network of 28 internment camps and almost 300 labor projects stretching from Columbia to Fredericton, New Brunswick, 
prisoners of war were in close proximity with Canadians right across the country. So this map here showing the red triangles are marking locations of internment camps. Each green dot is the location of a wood cutting camp, a yellow dot marking the location of farm labor, and then a few orange dots representing some mis miscellaneous projects. Um, so I'm gonna talk about briefly the three categories of prisoners that I'm gonna be talking about today, and then the three main, which are the three categories of prisoners that were in Canada, and in turn, the three categories of prisoners that were actually employed in the Metcalf area or in the Osgood area. So the first are civilian internees. These are, as the name suggests, uh, civilians of German or Italian descent who by birth um, were deemed threats to national security in Canada. So these were individuals living and working in Canada who were rounded up and placed in internment camps um, and many of whom spent most, if not all the war behind barbed wire. This also includes German and civilian, German and Italian civilians sent to Canada from the United Kingdom. The next category is enemy merchant seamen. They're technically civilian sailors um, that were representing either German or Italian companies. But because these ships were being used for the German war effort, uh, these individuals were detained um, in ports. Their ships were sunk at sea, and these individuals ended up in German camps here. And the last category are German combatants. These are members of the Army, Navy, and Air Force who were captured um, in various locations, basically around the world. Um, young as 16, as old as 70 plus, um, these prisoners ended up in camps across the country. So prisoners in Canada were uh, treated in accordance with the 1929 Geneva Conventions. This is essentially a set of rules that Canada agreed to regarding the treatment of prisoners of war. It also outlined the uh, rights prisoners had um, in regards to their treatment. Now you may notice I did not talk about Japanese Canadian internees. These individuals actually predominantly fell under the, organ or the administration of the Department of Labor. So they are kept uh, an entirely different category. Now internment in Canada began immediately following the German invasion of Poland and the outbreak of war on September 1st, 1939. The RCMP rounded up known enemy aliens deemed a risk to national security and began, uh, sorry, on September 4th, and within a week, over 246 uh, civilians were behind bars. These individuals were described as a menace to the safety of the state, and they included known members of the Nazi party, the Deutsche Bietesfront, German nationals, and naturalized Canadians of, German's birth who, of German birth whose activities brought their loyalty into question. Now this require the internment of civilians required internment camps. So the first were government owned and easily converted facilities like this one here, Camp K at Kananaskis, Alberta, Canada's first internment camp in the war, which was soon followed by Camp P at Petawawa, Ontario. Now the German invasion of France in May of 1940 brought a significant increase to Canadian internment operations. By June, France had occupied but in late May, Can uh, sorry, Great Britain had requested Canada to accept up to 9,000 internees and 3,000 combatants currently on British soil. The British feared that they were the next target of the German uh, the advance, and they wanted to send these prisoners somewhere safe. Canada agreed, and in the end of June 1940, the first shipment of these prisoners arrives. Now, over the course of the next seven years, Canada's internment operations expanded significantly from a few hundred individuals to thousands, peaking at about 35,000 in 1945. So you just see the graph here. The red line indicates prisoners that were arrested in Canada, and the blue are prisoners that are sent from the UK and other locations, um, primarily North Africa. So noticeable increases. Um, you'll see the first jump of the blue line um, is the initial shipments of prisoners from the UK. The second jump is the arrival of prisoners captured in North Africa. And the last, uh, third and last jump is the prisoners who were captured after the D-Day landings. And then you see a steady decline with the repatriation of prisoners in 1946. So more prisoners required Canada to build more camps. Uh, throughout the course of the war, there was a network of 28 internment camps. Each of them are marked here. Now I'll add that not all of them are, were operating at the same time. Um, but over the course of the war, there were 28 of these camps. So they were a mix of existing facilities and new and purpose-built facilities. 
So for example, uh, in the case of Camp R in Red Rock, Ontario, on the shore of Lake Superior, they made use of an abandoned pulp and paper mill. And closer to many of you, uh, Camp 32 at Hull made use of the newly built jail uh, just across the river. Whereas new camps were also required just to accommodate these significant number of prisoners. Camps like Camp 133 in Lethbridge, Alberta, one of Canada's two largest internment camps, each with a capacity of over 12,000 prisoners. And they included recreation halls, mess halls, workshop, lecture halls, hospital, and even the dental clinic. And as you can kind of see in the photo here, they had a central compound surrounded by two layers of barbed wire fences and guard towers constantly manned by guards. As for the guards, they were predominantly men of the Veterans Guard of Canada. These were First World War veterans who volunteered for service once more uh, in the 19, uh, 1939 or the early 1940s, but they were deemed too old to serve overseas. Instead, they, could, they were assigned uh, duties at home where they could still serve um, while freeing up the young Canadians for service overseas. Now, for the prisoners themselves, they tried to make the best of their time behind barbed wire. So this is Camp 23 in Monteith, Ontario. As you can kind of see here, Prisoners um, built soccer fields and walking paths, tennis courts and skating rinks in the winter. And the International Red Cross and the War Prisoners Aid of the YMCA um, provided additional recreational material and supplies, visits and relief to help ease the, basically the, the time behind barbed wire. And with this, prisoners played hockey. They built hockey teams, they established soccer teams, they established their own bands and orchestras, and even theatrical performances for the guards and uh, fellow prisoners alike. But the result was, ultimately this was their view. They were stuck behind the barbed wire fences. And this led to what has uh, kind of been coined as barbed wire psychosis, a psychological depression linked to uh, long captivity, homesickness, and increased anxiety. Now it's kind of in Canada's in interest to keep prisoners happy. Um, happy prisoners were less likely to cause trouble and happy prisoners were less likely to try and escape. And one of the ways was providing prisoners with brief uh, work opportunities outside the camp, whether this be cutting fuel wood uh, or working on nearby roads. And under the Geneva Convention, prisoners were allowed to work or pay, um, but it took Canada really three years after the first shipment arrived in 1940 for the country to actually agree on a way to employ prisoners. And this was prompted by a massive national labor shortage, particularly affecting the agricultural and logging industries. Because many of Canada's young laborers had either enlisted or had moved to essential war work in uh, wartime factories, leaving mass vacancies. So in May of 1943, Canada agrees to allow its first prisoners to go to work on fields in the Lethbridge, Alberta area. And over, oh, and I should add, prisoners while outside of the camp uh, wore these lovely denim uniforms with a large red target on the back. The prisoners aimed it had to be a nice big target because the guards were old and needed something to aim at when they were running away. The pants also had a large red stripe down the side to mark them as prisoners. Now between 1943 and 1946, as I kind of already mentioned already, there were about 300 labor projects um, stretching from New Brunswick to British Columbia. Green again marking um, wood cutting projects, yellow agriculture, and orange miscellaneous. And these projects employed about 14,000 uh, prisoners at their peak. Many of the prisoners ended up working in bush camps. Uh, this one in Riding Mountain National Park in Manitoba, close to where, where I grew up, was a bit of a uh, oddity in that it was a brand new camp built with government funds and included running water and electricity. But most prisoners ended up working in rustic bush camps with no such luxuries as running water or electricity, uh, but were operated by civilian companies. They appreciated the work, though, and the opportunity to live beyond the barbed wire. One prisoner wrote home, you cannot imagine how I felt after three years I finally saw a forest again. To wander through the woods and to once again have real work before me was something divine. Now, Many prisoners ended up working in farms, and farm work was kind of divided into three categories. Prisoners who were working from but still living in internment camps like Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, uh, 
prisoners who were employed in hostels, which were temporary tented camps uh, in kind of strategic areas. And as well as in the Metcalf case, prisoners who were living and working on individual farms, actually living with the farmers themselves. So these uh, the provided prisoners with really unprecedented freedom and the real first contact with the Canadian public. So again, after this first test project of prisoners working on farms in May of 1943 in the Lethbridge area, the Department of Labor elected to adopt two new programs. The first, establishing a 100-man hostel in Brooks, Alberta, and the second, the placing of selected anti-Nazi prisoners on farms in the Metcalf area, which is near Ottawa. Now, farmers willing to employ prisoners from Metcalf were required to submit a request to the Department of Labor, which would then be forwarded to the Department of National Defense. The farmers would undergo RCMP review, and if the, the military authorities approved, instructions would be issued to Camp 32 to provide a prisoner for work. And any prisoners removed from the farm work were to be immediately returned to Camp 32 and could not be placed on another farm without prior approval. So on August 9th, 1943, 38 anti-Nazi prisoners arrived at the Metcalf Fairgrounds and were distributed to the farms marked here. Now, due to record limitations, I know the community address of the farmers, but I don't actually know their exact locations of the farms. So that's why you see a bunch of dots centered around towns like Osgoode or Britannia Bay, um, or even Metcalf themselves. The prisoners weren't actually living generally in these communities, but farms in the surrounding area. Now, as anti-Nazis, anti all of these prisoners had been carefully vetted, and many who had actually requested protection from Canadian authorities in the face of threats or attacks by pro-Nazi comrades. These included individuals of Polish, French, Dutch, and Austrian descent who had deserted the army upon their capture in North Africa. And now their anti-Nazi classification meant that they did not require guards, but this did not mean that they were free men. Farmers employing prisoners all signed contracts, which stipulated the farmers were responsible for the safe custody of prisoners in their charge. The farmers were thus unofficial guards and had to ensure the prisoners remained on the farms, did not enter towns or villages without escort or fraternize with the public. And after a few weeks after their placement, uh, the program was evidently a success. And though, all, though some uh, prisoners had been returned to Camp 32, the Carleton County Agricultural Representative noted that the 25 new applications for prisoner of war labor suggested the prisoners were making good impressions. And over the next year, the program expanded to include 81 prisoners by October 1944. And this significantly increased the following year where over 200 prisoners were employed by August 1945 and 230 by August 1946. Unfortunately, record limitations, I know the farmers' names and the prisoners' names, but I don't know where the farmers were located for the 1945 and 1946. Now, the prisoners employed on uh, individual farms, uh, farmers had to pay the Department of Labor about $25 a month for each prisoner they employed. Of that, the prisoners received initially 20 cents a day, and then it was raised to about 50 cents a day. And the prisoners were employed as general farmhands. They helped in the fields, worked with livestock, they were essentially the same as a civilian farmhand, but the prisoners with one important difference could not leave the farms without an escort and anyone caught beyond the farm boundaries would be transferred to Camp 32. So farmers actually kept a close watch uh, on their prisoners to make sure they mostly stayed on the farm so as not to lose their farmhands. Now prisoners immediate reactions to farm work often express a satisfaction of leaving the confines of a barbed wire enclosure for an opportunity to work and live in relative freedom. In a letter to uh, his wife, one prisoner working on a farm wrote, I'm very happy here and have plenty to eat and drink. I only wish that you and the children were here to enjoy them with me. And many prisoners express size at the Canadian farms compared to their German counterparts, as well as the stark differences between the food shortages in Germany that the POWs were reading about in the newspaper and in their mail. But it's not to say that all prisoners were so happy. Um, among the initial complaints were long hours. Some prisoners were working as early as 4.30 in the morning to nine at night, seven days a week, whereas they were only supposed to be working six days a week. The Department of Labor eventually decreed that Prisoners would work six days a week, but would still have to do chores on their day off, which was Sunday, um, for a few hours, but they could not be forced to do more. 
And another farmer working near, and I'm going to butcher the name, I apologize, Serville, Ontario, uh, complained after he was told to go to the bathroom in the open or behind the barn or shed. So there was only one wash basin for the entire family. The bed sheets and coverlets were dirty and in tatters. And he was working between 14 and 16 hours a day. He requested his transfer. But the farmer and his family were so used to living to the poor living conditions, the prisoner asked the complaints not be shared with the farmer and his family so as to avoid hurting his feelings. He only wanted to move to another farm. Now, farmers were happy and generally expressed their satisfaction. And this is seen in the increased requests for prisoners. And some saw these prisoners like they're uh, just the same as Canadian farmhands or even maybe members of their own family. Ellen Faulkner uh, just wrote in a recent article that the prisoner of war working for her family, Vincent Meyer, who's the man on, or second man from the left, tried his best to learn English and even help the kids with their reading and homework. One Ottawa area farmer even brought his POW to a bar with him, uh, which obviously resulted in some uproar in Ottawa. And some of these elements crossed the line between a work relationship and fraternization. And relaxing regulations unsurprisingly led to some trouble as prisoners were more and more often spotted in local communities, sometimes escorted by their farmer, but more often not. And I'm assuming some of you may recognize this location here, the Osgood Lighthouse Dance Hall, a popular location um, for decades. Now prisoners, although they had clear instructions not to leave their farm without an escort, some either ignored their orders or attended dances alongside their employees who often provided them with civilian clothing. At Osgood, the RCMP discovered POWs attending, attending dances in September and August, or in August and September of 1944. And after interviewing residents, learned that the POWs also frequented the local ice cream parlor, wore civilian clothing, visited other farms, and spent their Sundays swimming and boating at the local beach. One POW even reportedly fathered a child with a local woman. Now, once aware of the matter, police and military authorities kept a closer watch on these POWs and transferred uh, offenders back to the base camp. Employers also began keeping a closer eye on their prisoners as they don't want to lose their farmhands. And although RCMP surveillance and military authorities warning farmers reduced friction in 1944, some POWs were once again seeming, seen roaming Osgood the following summer. Now, despite the freedom uh, that these prisoners enjoyed, escapes proved exceptionally rare, at least initially. All prisoners working near Metcalf were classified as anti-Nazis, so obviously few wanted return, to return to Nazi Germany. And instead, we see, actually see an increase of escape attempts after Germany surrenders in 1945. But these prisoners are actually motivated by a desire not to return to Germany. Carl Link, working for Thomas Gamble of Britannia Bay, and George Gross, working for the Wallace Brothers at Bell's Corners, left their farms on, October, on August 31st, 1945, and by bike, pedaled all their way down to the St. Lawrence River. With a boat they discovered on the riverbank, they crossed the river to the United States. They sold their bicycles in Troy, New York, and used the proceeds to purchase train tickets to New York, where they arrived on September 5th. An Austrian civilian provided them with clothing there, but when they um, informed him that they were escaped prisoners, he told them to go away. Two days later, the pair ran out of money and with nothing else to do, turned themselves in. Other escapes proved a little more successful. EMS Egon Rossell was working at the farm of Castle Perot at Serbo. Uh, he was strongly recommended for release by Canadian authorities, but British intelligence suspected he may actually be a pro-Nazi or communist. He left the farm on September 30th, 1945, making his way first to Ottawa to visit a friend there before disappearing. With a wife and child in New York, it's suspected that he returned to them, but he never resurfaced again. Uh, Enemy merchant seaman Emil Bachstadt in the middle there was a former professional boxer who had joined an anti-fascist organization in Germany before the war and refused to join the Nazi party. The war had claimed his brother who had died in a concentration camp as well as his mother and sister who had both died in an air raid and his marriage had collapsed as his wife and in-laws were all members of the Nazi party. With little left to lose, he left the farm of Alex Warnock on, at Herdman's Bay on June 16th, 1946 and simply disappeared. He was never recaptured. And finally, Walter Breit was working for Scott McCurdy at Stittsville. A passionate anti-Nazi, uh, Breit was an author in pre-war life. And October 15th, 1946, he simply left the farm and disappeared. 
For seven years, he was on the lam until he was actually arrested in Long Lac, Ontario in September 1953. But at that point in time, the RCMP and the British government were not interested in pursuing escaped prisoners. And he was actually allowed to remain in Canada and later became a Canadian citizen. Now, Canada started looking at returning its POWs to the United Kingdom in 1946. And this prompted about 6,000 prisoners to apply to stay in Canada. And there was support from the farmers for prisoners to remain, for prisoners to be considered for citizenship. Harry Woodburn wrote to the local newspaper, I had never had a better worker, a more civil, clean, or honest man in my employ, describing this prisoner of war. He has worked with other men, one of whom was a Canadian soldier who served five years in the army in this country. I wouldn't give my POW's little finger for a dozen like him. Now, reaction kind of varied. The more one interacted with or benefited from prisoner of war labor, like the farmers, the more likely they would approve the idea of prisoners staying in Canada. Resistance came most often from urban centers like Ottawa, where residents saw prisoners enjoying more freedom than they deemed appropriate. They did not equate the presence, the presence and employment of prisoners with you know, increased sugar, wheat, or tomatoes. They only saw enemy soldiers far too close to home. And branches of the Canadian Legion were thus unsurprisingly among the most vocal opponents. Now, while Canada was considering what to do with these prisoners, four individuals would receive special permission to remain in Canada. And one of these individuals is Clements Cobb, who had a connection to uh, the Osgood area. Uh, after being captured in uh, November, or sorry, in, yeah, 1942, Cobb, who was a medical student, was sent to Canada. He ended up working on the farm of Eel, Eel Peaver near Bern. Uh, but was actually hired by the Ontario Civic Hospital in October 1944. Due to his work uh, at the hospital, he was, one, he was one of four prisoners granted special permission to remain in Canada and was released in July of 1946. He continued his studies in Ottawa, graduating from Carleton in 1949, and then from uh, Ottawa University, he graduated from medical school in the early 1950s. He later moved to Michigan, where he lived for the remainder of his life and passed away in 1995. Now, despite pleas from prisoners, farmers, and civilians alike, prisoners were recalled from all farms in November of 1946. The following month, camp, the Canadian government produced a list of about 220 anti-Nazis to stay, many of whom who had worked in the Osgood area. These individuals were all carefully selected based on their political soundness, medical fitness, and a sincere desire to become useful Canadian citizens. But before a decision could be made, the news was leaked to the press and prompted mass opposition to favoring prisoners, enemy soldiers, to the thousands of refugees in Europe. So on December 19th, the Canadian government announced that all prisoners in Canada would be transferred to the United Kingdom in the coming weeks. And the last, most of the last prisoners would leave later that month. By January 1947, only 39 prisoners were either in Canada or were unaccounted for. 21 had escaped, including the three that I had mentioned earlier. 12 were awaiting, tra awaiting transfer. There were five medical cases and one in jail. As for the thousands of prisoners transferred to the United Kingdom in 1946, their captivity was not over. They were quickly added to the roughly 400,000 other prisoners already in British soil, and many would be employed in the agricultural and cleanup work. Most would not return to Germany until 1947. But a few never gave up hope of returning to Canada and were already making plans for the return. Uh, once returning to Germany, they found their homes destroyed, their families displaced, missing or dead. So they began applying uh, for immigration and Canada continued to receive applications from former POWs in the immediate post-war years. But each time the application received the same answer, no. Until 1950, when Canada lifted its restriction on enemy states, and prisoners once again had the opportunity to return to Canada, this time as free men. And many of these prisoners, such as Heinrich Vogel, who is the uh, man in the middle of this photograph, uh, returned to the places that they had once lived and worked, often resuming the same type of work, whether it be logging or agricultural, and their former employers, these farmers, actually helped sponsor them return, to return. So appreciative of the treatment they had received, many left Canada in 1946 different men than when they had arrived. And whether or not they were able to return, their time in Canada had left a lasting impression. Work brought them into contact with Canadians and exposed them to the Canadian way of life. And for most of them, they greatly enjoyed their life beyond barbed wire. <laughs> 
Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, you can always feel free to check out my website or send me an email. And I think we're doing questions after Jane's presentation. Thanks, Michael. That's a great introduction. That's really interesting. So I'm going to tell you a bit about one specific story of a uh, POW in Metcalf. So I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. Oh, wait a minute. I might have to do that. Okay, wait a minute. Are you, uh, could you just let me know, are you seeing my pictures now? Have I successfully shared screen? I don't think I have. have Not I? yet. Not yet. Okay, wait, let's try that one more time. Um, okay. How about that? Yes. There we go. Okay, got it. Okay, so um, so I want to tell you about uh, one particular family in the Metcalf area that had a prisoner of war. So I want to start out by showing you this picture, you know, and just ask you, you know, what do you see in this picture? Does this look like a war picture to you? Do you see, you know, can you see part of the Canadian war effort in this photograph? Well, you know, we, we say a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm going to give you the thousand words behind this particular story. And it's, I want to start at the beginning with two men, Fritz Dornseef and Benson Latimer, born around the same time, but on two sides of the Atlantic in two very different worlds. So Benson Latimer, who you may remember from the lecture in October, um, was born north of Metcalf in a farmhouse uh, north of Metcalf. And he was a fairly typical Canadian guy, um, grew up playing hockey. Here we have him in his hockey uniform around the 1920s. And, and he, uh, he fell in love with Hilda. Um, late 1920s, they got married when he was about 22 and she was 24 and they uh, started farming together and they got a farm, a hundred acre farm um, on Bank Street. It's the White House, big farm, white farmhouse just south of Victoria Street on Bank Street. Um, you can still see it. Uh, it's on the east side of Bank Street. Um, and they started farming. So uh, Hilda and Benson were farming during the Depression. Um, a difficult time to be starting out a farming business, um, but I think they were fairly successful. And here we have some pictures of them with their horses and their equipment. Um, to be clear, this was a, before the days when tractors were common. So farmers were using workhorses for um, almost all of their farming. The, the tractor that's in the picture in the, uh, the middle of the screen here is a rented tractor that's been rented to uh, with a threshing machine for the threshing. But uh, Benson did not own a tractor. He did have a car an old beat up car, but he had a car, but he had workhorses. So farming was farming was hard work, very labor intensive. Um, Benson also uh, made maple sugar. Um, and that also used a lot of horses and also very heavy, heavy work. So now Fritz Dornseef was born roughly around the same time, maybe around 1907, we don't know exactly. He, he came from the city of Munster in Germany, which was an ancient, ancient German city. And he came from a family of construction workers. So his father was a, a stonemason. Um, now Fritz grew up uh, after the First World War. So in the 1920s, like Benson. But 1920s uh, Germany was in the middle of a complete economic collapse as a result of uh, the disaster of the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, very difficult for young men to find jobs, hyperinflation, unemployment. So Fritz did something which um, a surprising number, several thousand Germans did. He went off and he joined the French Foreign Legion to get work. And he went to North Africa and he spent five years in North Africa with the French Foreign Legion, basically defending the French Empire. Now, in the 1930s, um, early 1930s, the Nazis came to power in Germany. Um, and uh, Fritz was, as he, because he was serving a foreign army, he was considered by the Nazis as a traitor. And he lost his German citizenship and he came home um, and uh, was treated very badly by the Nazis. He was under the surveillance of the Gestapo. He had to report weekly. He was under threat of internment. So he certainly had no reason to be a supporter of the Nazi party. But he came home to live with his parents and he went back to construction work. Now, uh, September 
September 1939, the war begins, Second World War begins, and uh, by June 1940, the Germans have invaded North Africa, and they're fighting with the British and the French in North Africa. And the German government remembers that actually they have uh, this group of Germans who have a lot of experience fighting in North Africa because they've been with the French Foreign Legion. And so Fritz gets drafted into the German army. Um, into a regiment made up exclusively of ex-French Foreign Legion soldiers, so a very sort of odd group, and they're sent off to fight in North Africa. Um, and by 1942, they're captured. He's captured at Tobruk in a big battle with the British. And uh, as a prisoner of war then, the, the British are not going to keep him in Africa, they don't have the facilities for that, so they ship all these prisoners off to Canada. So he's on a ship for, for six weeks or whatever, traveling um, all the way around uh, the Cape and in and out of South America and all the way into New York and across by train. And he ends up in an Alberta prisoner of war camp, like the camps that uh, one of those camps that um, Michael has showed us. And he's there for a year and then he gets transferred to one of the forestry camps in Manitoba. And all of this time, he and his friends who have been with the French Foreign Legion um, and then in the German army are being harassed by the Nazis in the camps. And eventually he goes to the Mounties. He turns himself into the Mounties with a couple of his friends and they beg to be removed to a camp where they will be safe because they're worried that they're actually gonna get killed in the camp by, by some of the Nazis in the camps. And so he's sent to Hull in 1944. So he ends up in that camp that Michael's been telling us about. So now what's happening with Benson at the same time? Well, for Benson and Hilda, um, the Second World War was, was actually um, a, a good time to be farming. There was a big demand for um, farm products and uh, providing food to the British was a big part of the Canadian war effort. Um, the Prime Minister of Canada committed to supply large amounts of food to Britain. And so, for instance, in 1944, uh, the Canadian government had committed to send 125 million pounds of cheese to England. So cheese was an important product. And Benson and Hilda have a dairy farm. So they are selling milk to a cheese factory that was actually right at the corner of Bank Street in Victoria. So right, if you know the wood pellet factory that's on that corner, There used to be a cheese factory there. And Benson and uh, Hilda ha were milking their cows every day and selling their milk to, to that factory. That was one of their main products. So I'll give you a quick overview of what their farm was like. What was a small farm like in, um, in the 1940s in the Metcalf area? So here we have Benson and Hilda. So they had something like 50 to 20 milk cows. They had a bull and then of course there would have been calves that went with the cows. They had perhaps 50 hens producing eggs. They would keep a few geese, which they sometimes sold. They had five workhorses. To, uh, to do all the farm work. And they might have six or eight pigs that they were using for pork for themselves, for the family. Then for crops, they grew corn. They grew oats for feed for the, the horses and the cattle. Um, they had a big vegetable garden with potatoes that they were feeding themselves out of. They were making the maple syrup and then they were producing hay. And in particular, they had to produce a lot of hay because they needed to feed the horses and they needed to feed the cows all winter. So making hay was a very um, big part of what they were doing every year. And making hay in those days was very labor intensive. It took a lot of, um, there was, because there was no baler and there was no tractor, you're using the horses, horse-drawn equipment, horse-drawn um, mower, horse-drawn rake. But then once the hay is down in the field, you're, you're putting it into coils with, with a hand, hand rake, and then you're pitchforking that hay by hand up into a wagon. And then when you get it up into the barn, you're pitchforking it around the barn. So very, very labor intense process, producing all that hay to feed the horses and to feed the cattle. So um, Benson and uh, Hilda have three children. There's Joyce was 15 and Floyd and Bill were just six and nine. And they helped out on the farm, of course, but they could not, um, they couldn't provide enough help to, um, to make the difference on the farm. So Benson had to have a hired man. So during the early parts of the war, he had Stuart Kennedy. And at the beginning of the war, hired hands on farms were actually exempt from going into the army or the armed forces. Um, because the government uh, knew how important it was to provide food to Britain. And so they exempted all these, these hired labor from going into the army. But by the not late mid 1940s, um, the need in the army is very big. Uh, if you remember June 1944, D-Day, the government had been ramping up the army for that invasion. And so Stuart um, goes into the army. He joins the army 
But that leaves Benson and Hilda shorthanded on the farm. They needed a man to help. So Benson, Benson has family friends around Metcalf who'd had a prisoner of war um, the year before in 1943. So Frank Stanley was an old family friend. In 1943, he'd had, had a prisoner of war all summer. So Benson probably heard from him that uh, the, 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 this was a good deal, that these guys were good workers. And so he decides he's going to get a hired hand. So he, he takes Joyce along for the ride. They get in the car, they go over to Hull, and they pick up Fritz. And Fritz comes home to work on his farm. And he comes home in one of those uniforms. Here we've got a picture from, uh, from the museum at Fort Henry. They've got one of these, these uh, uniforms on display with a great big red dot on the back and the red stripe. And so um, Fritz moves in with the, with the family. And of course they're not, um, uh, so Fritz, he moves into the attic over the summer kitchen. He's eating at the family dining table. He's working with Benson all day. Technically, he's not supposed to be fraternizing with his employer, but, you know, he becomes almost like a family member. Um, and even in May, he actually, uh, he signs Joyce's autograph book for her. And this is how we know that Fritz came from Munster, because he, he said, in, you know, under his, his name there, you can see that he said he came from, from Germany, Munster. And he wrote on one side of the page in English, on the other side in German. So... So here we get back to the photograph. So what is what is this a picture of? Well, this this is a picture of farming for the war effort. So Fritz worked with the Latimers for about 10 months in 1944 into the very beginning in 1945, making hay, planting and harvesting corn, helping them to keep the dairy going to support the cheese production that was vital to the war effort. They got along well. And so they took him took him along in this family outing when they went to Britannia Beach in August for the day. Um, they took him to the Metcalf Fair in September. So he was, you know, he was well integrated into the family. But as, um, as Michael was saying, you know, not everybody agreed with this. There would have been plenty of people in Metcalf who had sons um, in the army um, fighting in Germany at risk of being killed by Germans who would have been very suspicious of these German prisoners of war, right? And, and they've had five years of propaganda from the Canadian government telling them that, you know, the propaganda from the government and then that you read in the newspapers was very much all Germans are bad, all Germans are Nazis, all Germans are evil, they're all our enemies. And for, you know, for the people in the farming areas who were then told 1943-44, well, well, maybe some of these Germans actually aren't our enemies and they're not so bad. And in fact, you could have one on your farm and you might even have him living in your house and that would be okay. And I think for some people that was probably um, a very big change in messaging and a very difficult message to, to absorb. So, um, a lot of controversy, I think. Anyway, uh, eventually um, Fritz does go back to the Hall camp in January 1945 after working for 10 months on the farm. And all this time through the fall of 1944, he would have been reading in the newspapers or hearing from the newspapers from time to time about the massive bombing raids in Germany on, on German cities. And that included Munster, his hometown. So I'm sure he was wondering all the time what had happened to his family. So what happened afterwards? Well, um, so Fritz uh, uh, did, eventually got back to Munster in 1947. He worked, he worked the summer after he was with Benson with a different farmer in the Ottawa area. Um, then he went back out to Alberta for a year. And then finally, 1947, he goes back. And what does he come back to? Well, this is a picture of Munster. So the city that he came from in Germany, um, by 1945, 90% of the city center is completely destroyed. I don't know if you can see in this picture, the cathedral somehow survived but the, the buildings all around it are basically just shells. And the population was down to about you know, 15, 17% of the population that had been there in 1939 when he left. So um, phenomenal destruction. So Fritz, Fritz lives the rest of his life in Munster. He, he lives in Munster until he dies in, around 1966. Um, he worked in construction as a mason. I, I imagine that he spent his time rebuilding the city um, as did uh, many construction workers in Germany. Um, he got married. He had a wife, Bertha. Um, and that's about all we know about him. Benson, uh, Benson and Hilda eventually retired from farming and went to live in Metcalf to live in the house that I live in now. Um, and Benson became an insurance agent. And we know that he probably did always remember his um, his German POW, fond, POW fondly um, because we know they, they went on exchanging, exchanging Christmas cards all through the 1950s. And Benson and Hilda both lived until 1991. 
to a good old age. And Joyce is still alive and going strong. And I have to thank Joyce for telling me her memories about the summer of 1944 and the POW who worked on their Metcalf farm. And so that's that's the end of my presentation. And then I think we're going to throw it open to questions. And I guess Jillian's going to come back on and maybe facilitate that. Thank you so much, Michael and Jane, for um, the extremely enlightening presentations on a on a story. Um, and part of our history that's little known. And uh, so I really appreciate you shedding some more light on that. And um, I just wanna open it up and see if there's any comments or questions. Um, it's a quite an interesting topic. So I'm interested to see if anyone has any questions. So you can uh, unmute yourself if you like, or um, put your question into the chat function at the bottom of the screen. But uh, we, we uh, encourage all questions. And if we don't have any questions, I have a couple of quotes from our um, from a book um, that I don't know if Corrine is uh, in attendance tonight, but she's a local history and historian, um, not far from the Osgoode Museum, and uh, she uh, initially did some research on the Metcalf Project, and that's how I stumbled across it um, at the museum. So um, I hear we've got some questions here from Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, do we know if Fritz spoke English by the time he got to Metcalf? Uh, yeah, I believe he did speak some English. Um, I, I think not really well. Um, and we would assume that possibly he spoke good French because he'd been with the French Foreign Legion. But we don't know that for sure because there were a lot of Germans in the French Foreign Legion. Um, but yeah, he was, he obviously he was able to figure out what he needed to do on the farm at least. Um, any idea why Fritz left the farm if things were going well? No, we don't, we don't really know what happened at the end. Um, perhaps um, Benson just didn't need his labor anymore and was, you know, by January didn't need a farm hand at that time. I don't really know. Um, perhaps there was some sort of falling out. We don't know the, we don't know all the details on that. Um, Lori had a question, was Osgood Lighthouse at the present Taylor Park? No, actually it's south of of that park, um, it's where modern realty office is currently. So it's just south on uh, on River Road. Oh, who's the lady standing beside Joyce and Benson? That is Mrs. Cowan, who was a family friend who went along for the outing for the day. And Kara, yeah, at least uh, there were at least two German prisoners of war who farmed near Morewood Neck. Yeah, yeah, there were quite a few. Like we had over fifty. And the list that we have of internees is not even complete. We're working on, on Metcalf and area farms. Yeah, my list or my list shows about two peaking at about 230. Wow. By 1946. So okay, so Michael, there's a question here about where does one start researching for the records? Yeah, so most of my research um, was done at Library and Archives Canada. Um, some of the stuff is organized into files specifically pertaining to Metcalf, but some of the stuff is just dumped into more general things. And then uh, for my dissertation, I did research literally across the country. So there's stuff in kind of archives in all over, whether it's, you know, small like local museums um, or provincial or, or national institutions. There's, there's a little bit everywhere. And I'm keep find, I keep finding stuff everywhere I go, so. Well, and I and I went out and I talked to Joyce Waddell um, about about what she remembered from her family history. So, you know, you need to combine the the records from museums and archives with uh, the family stories because they're also a big part of it. Okay. Were POWs treated better in Canada than Germany, Michael? What would you say to that? Yes, generally yes. So the idea we think of, you know, Canada is very displaced from the front lines. You think Germany is also being bombed at this time, so their priority wasn't essentially put into treating the POWs the best they possibly could. Um, but I'll also add that you know Canada, or I get a lot of the questions. You know why were prisoners treated so well here when Canadians were treated so poorly overseas? Um, and I think the question of like the answer to that is um, you know Canada was trying to take the moral high ground. And trying to treat the the prisoners, you know, in accordance with the Geneva Convention or better, um, in the hopes that Canadian prisoners in Germany would also be treated better. It doesn't really play out that way, but you know, I think as Canadians, we can be proud that we honestly did our best. So, 
Well, let me ask you, Michael, would it not be true, though, that the Germans treated Canadian prisoners, for instance, a lot better than they treated their Russian prisoners? Yes, for sure. So if you, that is also the Geneva Convention coming into play. Um, both Canada and Germany were signatories of the convention with each other, but were not signature, but the Soviet Union and Germany were not signatories with each other. So there were no international guidelines pertaining to the treatment of POWs in the Soviet Union or Soviet prisoners in Germany. Um, and to answer Laurie's question, Camp 32 is at the uh, Hull detention facility, which is still in operation today. We have, um, I, I know, Michael, um, you had earlier in your presentation, you had mentioned Ellen Faulkner and um, I'm, Assuming it's the same Ellen that yes. well, yes, participated in our presentation today, but uh, uh, her note here says, thank you to Jane and Michael for your presentations. I was saddened to hear that many German workers had to return to the UK and then apply for immigration. The pictures Michael showed were taken at the Falcon Farm. Um, uh, Heinrich Henry uh, obviously applied to return to Canada. I wonder whether any research is interviewing the former Ger German prisoners of war um, and their families to document their recollections of working on the farm in Canada during the war and to find out how they got along in Canada after returning. Did they experience discrimination due to being German? Yeah, I first want to thank Ellen because we just connected the last couple of days and she was uh, very gracious to allow me to share the photos um, from her family's collection. Um, yes, I am. <laughs> All right, to answer that question, I'm trying to track down former POWs who returned to Canada. Um, as far as I know, there's no, like, there's no central project. It was a project I've proposed and hoping to do some work in the future. Um, but through my website and blog, I connect through a lot of former, not so much POWs, just because with their age, they've all passed, most of them have passed away. Um, but a lot of their families, you know, I get inquiries every week about people are just asking about their grandfather or their father or their uncle or someone who was a POW here. Um, and most of them, yeah, they, they got along. They, as I kind of said, and then even Ellen in the photos, you see where um, Heinrich or Henry returns to the area that he, he works. So these are actually um, prisoners who are sponsored to come back to Canada because they needed money, they, ne they often needed someone to sponsor it. So former employers, whether it be a logging company like Abitibi um, or an individual farmer, they actually sponsor these prisoners to come back. Prisoners would spend a year or two working on a farm or in the bush um, where they're welcome because you know they were kind of treated as members of the family and that continues. Um, and then they all go off on their own way, but we see a lot of them uh, former prisoners kind of maintaining connections with each other. They're also often settling in areas where there is a, um, either German settlements or German immigrants, just with language barrier or just cultural differences. So they kind of go there. So, but you do see some discrimination because, you know, by the time they're arriving here in 1951, the war's only been over for six years. And, you know, lots of people had lost their husbands, fathers, sons and you know they never sometimes never got over that so um and then just a follow-up to that one she said wonderful i look forward to hearing more about your research in the future this is a very exciting project thanks Ellen. Um, <laughs> and another question we have from Raphael: um were there any deaths in the canadian uh, pow camps yes so it's something i just didn't get a chance to mention because it doesn't really pertain to Metcalf, but we have about 150 POWs who die in Canada during the Second World War. The vast majority, majority of these are medical incidents or related. So whether it be, you know, it's often cancer um, is the leading cause of death in POWs in Canada. But you, just because of the nature of the work they were doing, there were a lot of work-related accidents. So especially in Northern Ontario bush camps where safety wasn't always a priority, whether they're hit by fallen trees or um, they die in boating accidents were especially popular, or they die because they get lost in a blizzard. Um, but there are some individuals who commit suicide. Um, we actually have two prisoners, at least two prisoners who are murdered by their fellow pro-Nazi prisoners. Um, and then in turn, 
prisoners who are executed and hung by Canadian authorities because of their involvements in those murders. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's about 150. Wow. And that, and that, you know, the part of Fritz's story is that when he, he asks to, uh, when he goes to the RCMP and asks to be moved to the camp in Hull, he references the fact that that there, you know, that there has been this um, uh, this other POW who was hung by the prisoners in the camp because he was a French Foreign Legion soldier previously and considered to be a traitor. So that's Fritz's argument for why he feels his life is in danger, and you know, perhaps it was because there had been this murder not that long before in the camps that he was in in Alberta. Jane, uh, am I reading an article for publication? No, I am thinking about writing a historical novel around this story instead of like an article. I, I think this is a this is a story that could be could be told through historical fiction. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, um, and to go, oh sorry, oh sorry, I go back to Alex's you, yeah. question, yeah, about the dead POWs returned to Germany. No, they actually. Um, so the prisoners were essentially buried where they died or in the, uh, a nearby community. Um, so if they died in Medicine Hat, they were buried in Medicine Hat. If they died in a bush camp in Northern Ontario, they were buried in Sault Ste. Marie or Thunder Bay. Um, and then you have basically these prisoners in, I think it's something like 50 different cemeteries across the country. So there was a, an effort by the Canadian government and the German War Graves Commission to consolidate those graves. Um, so the bodies were all exhumed in the 1970s and relocated to Kitchener, Ontario, where uh, there is a small plot in the Woodland Cemetery there, where nearly all of them are buried. There were a few graves that could not be found. Yeah. Well, I don't see any other uh, questions or comments coming in. Um, and we've hit an hour, so we're, we're just in time for a presentation tonight. And again, I want to thank Michael and Jane for joining us this evening um, on behalf of the Oscar Tangent Museum. We really appreciate you uh, providing insight into this topic. And uh, many thanks to our participants tonight for joining our presentation. For those who couldn't make it, um, the video will be available um, on our YouTube channel. Right. Thanks, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you, and thank you, Jillian, thank you. for hosting us. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Jillian. <laughs> Anytime. Thanks for, yeah. thanks for your help, Michael. Not a problem. Thank you. Take care. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.